Hey guys, welcome back to No Tux Allowed. Uh, I am your host Josh, and uh, right there is a is another guy uh, who I'm not gonna name yet because you know he he's not ready for it. He he just doesn't look ready uh, because you know I have an important announcement I need to make. I have a I have a co-host with me. His name is Big Pod. How's it going today? Hello, hello, doing great. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, now that we got the now now that we got the big news of the show out of the way here, <laughs> I, as in uh, you know nothing's changed about it. <laughs> uh, big Pod, I had to reinstall Gen Two. Really? Yep, I had to reinstall uh, because I realized I made a mistake. What uh, if you guys if, if you guys have watched Distro Hacking at all? It's a live it's a live stream. It's the the almost weekly live stream. Uh, we're going to be getting back to weekly as soon as you know I get a consistent enough schedule to make it weekly again. Uh, uh, I did a Gen two install and I selected a multi lib a no multi lib profile. So I I built a system without any kind of thirty two bit support at all. Wow. And uh, I was running this uh, system perfectly fine. Like, uh, if I wanted to like load up Steam games, I was I was using the Steam Flatpak, and they were working. Well, uh, I ran into an issue where all of a sudden I couldn't game get games to launch anymore. <laughs> uh, not not through Steam, but I could get them to work. I could get them to launch through Lutris. Uh, now, uh. Which was also installed as a flat pack. So uh, we're tr we're trying to troubleshoot this, right? And yeah. I realized I uh, that the Steam error output is not giving me anything useful relating to the flat pack. So uh, I purged the flat pack out of the system, reinstall, same issue. And I'm like, okay. So I install uh, Steam on my laptop. As a as a native package, because my laptop is also running Gen two, and, but I didn't install it without without thirty two bits uh, support, so it's a, it's actually got it. So uh, I install uh, Steam onto that, which yes, it did take some time because that that laptop's only got like a seventh gen Core i five or something like that. It's nothing special, but then again, my desktop's nothing special either, and uh, that's launching games perfectly fine. I uh, and I connected it to the same NFS share that my desktop uses to launch the game. So it's, it's like, okay, so it's not an issue with with uh, the, with network file share. So then it's just like, okay, let's try installing Steam natively on the file system rather than through the flat pack. And this is where I started running into issues. Because uh, yeah. I thought I I thought it was just as simple as selecting a different profile in Gentoo, uh, to enable the 32-bit support. Isn't well, it? then it turned in, then it turned into a bit of a rabbit hole. Really? Yeah, because uh, I could get uh, several of the packages to just automatically recompile for me, and then I had, and then it just kept erroring out on me, and I I've, I've come to the conclusion. That I need to sort through dependency hell to uh, recompile every single package by hand, one at a time, with the 32-bit support. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so uh, that was going to be several hours of effort, and I had a scheduled live stream that night for the last the last episode of Distro Hacking as we're recording <laughs> this. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, uh, I have two choices. I could theoretically install Gen 2 faster than it would take to fix this issue. I could go with a normal person distro. Or we can go through with this anyway. <laughs> Obviously, I went with the last option because I'm a masochist. Uh, and I gave up after about an hour. So I just reinstalled Gen two, uh, and this time we th this uh, current installation. I decided it's been a minute since I used OpenRC, right? So uh, I'm running OpenRC right now, which is 
you know, a perfectly acceptable in, in its system. It's it's is it better than system D? No. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like uh, there's a couple of things that system D has that are that it's got that are nice to have. Yes. But uh, you know, OpenRC is running, uh, and then I figure out that uh, I can't get audio working. I'm like okay, well I know Pulse Audio. It's a sock that uh, it it just runs as like a sock that uh, you know when a- when application launches it just manually spins with Pulse Audio server. Well, I'm using Pipewire because you know Wayland. Yep. And and uh, well, uh, it turns out that uh, Gentoo ha- that Gentoo uses this handy little script called the Gentoo Pipewire Launcher to uh, run and execute Pipewire. And I was trying to call this in my uh, display manager configuration, which it doesn't seem to actually auto start. So uh, we're still working on fixing that issue. Uh, right now, what it is, I have an open terminal running with uh, you know just manually starting starting the sound system that is to uh, record this episode. So really? uh, we're 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 uh, working on a uh, system that's running in production right now with an open terminal that could potentially crash. <laughs> because, you know, we like it. We like adding points of failure to our uh, production machine. Great. <laughs> Good job. Yep. Yep. But, hey, maybe it'll work a bit more reliably next week. <laughs> yep. But I also heard that you've been having issues of your own. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, something to do with like accidentally purging a database (laughs) well Uh, and i know you've been hinting at it and you know i want to hear the breakdown of this because you know uh, it's fascinating to hear like how you broke things and then fix things (laughs) so let's start from the beginning we're talking about mastodon mastodon is mainly written in ruby so hello huge memory usages hello being slow because it's dynamic interpreted language and those are never fast dynamic isn't fast interpreted isn't fast together they are a lot not fast but for me that's not a problem i can run as many things as i need because it's actually fairly okay architected it uses multiple processors uses queues and you can get things running and but you need some some amount of hardware to do it because you need a lot of ram and do not disparage uh, ruby a lot let's remember github gitlab both are very very fast sites written in ruby for me the problem came when i was trying to do some uh, maintenance on my Kubernetes cluster. I was going to back up everything. And I I haven't logged into my Mastodon probably in a few days. And as soon as I started the backup process, uh, Postgres started throwing me errors. Oh boy. Yeah. While the tables on it, in Mastodon database was corrupted and corrupted to such a degree that I couldn't recover it. Nothing could be done about it. So then I tried to maybe if I would have would happen to be able to restore the database, so like get it into working state while not having that table or recreated the table. Yeah, uh, Mastodon doesn't have that kind of advanced capabilities. And I made air quotes for those of you in audio. Only land. And, like, they have some ability to migrate their, uh, their database up and down, whatever. But nothing in their system is that would allow you to actually go and rebuild the database if it got corrupted. Technically speaking, I could like 
com create a completely new database and just copy the creation for that one table, but then it would still lag the data and that was still a problem. So at that point, I saw only one Hail Mary for it. Completely wipe, wipe the Mastodon and start over. Yeah, that, that didn't work either. Uh -oh. It appears that table is necessary for even for the wipe process. Okay. <laughs> I'm not joking. That table, it, it's uh, basically, it's, it's one of the very important tables. If it's not there, or if it's isn't working, you ain't you ain't doing anything. Okay, so uh, at this point, we're looking at potentially just purge absolutely everything and start from bare scratch. We cannot do even that. I literally oh, need to create a new instance. Either case, I need to go from complete scratch, and there is a good percentage chance. I will not be able to use the same domain I used up until now. Hmm. Hmm. Because okay. from what I know, that that why process need to be to be done for someone to reuse a domain. And okay. Now, uh, color me weird. But I know that you can't just rsync a running Postgres database. Like, there's actually a process you have to go through to back, yeah. back up a database. Yeah. You, you did follow all the correct steps, right? All the correct steps. And right away, I got an error. This database basically, basically said, this, data, this, this table is corrupted. You cannot continue. Okay. <laughs> and after, after I was already going, after I was already committed to self-destruct to go and just wipe everything start over from completely from scratch i started experimenting at that point i also started experimenting with all my databases because i was like if there is one table that's corrupted there has to be many the grand total number of tables corrupted in the whole database as in i have a mastodon that's in that dbms i have i have uh uh, GitLab, and I have a couple of personal databases. Guess how many tables were corrupted? Probably about three or four. Grand total of one. Oh, just, just one. that and one data and, and one <laughs> table. One table among probably 500 tables was corrupted. No idea how. My storage wasn't the problem. I thought it was the storage. It wasn't. And yeah, I'm so at this point, I wiped everything clean and I'm starting from scratch everything. I'm re-architecting the cluster. I'm re-architecting the storage. I am re-architecting the database system. I'm going with a proper, uh, proper replicated setup. Everything, I'm, now I'm doing everything properly proper when I was doing some things hacky before. Yeah. Now, uh... How much of a pain is it to actually set up like Mastodon appropriately? Because uh, it's been something I've been like considering for a while, just seeing if I can just like set up my own Mastodon instance. But I know that some people seem to uh, just spin up Pleroma, which is a Fediverse alternative to Mastodon, uh, because it, you know it's supposedly simpler. It's not all that hard. If you follow their guide, you should be okay, especially if you're using something. Like Docker containers. Although when it comes to upgrades, the Docker containers aren't up to the standard. That's for sure. But if you're doing something like the Docker container, it's running the right Docker container, passing the right file in, and you're done. But that file needs to be passed to every container because you're gonna need more multiple containers at that point. And you're gonna need to oh, and I just put all the containers in the same Docker compose file, that way they can all yes. be networked together too. Yeah. Yes. That's the kind of thing you need to do. Oh, you, you don't really need a lot of networking between the containers because they all talk 
talk to each other with a database. Okay. Because the, each of them are, are for certain types of data. So, uh, so architecture of Macedon is you have your main API server, you have your UI, which the most ironic part is UI is is using uh, Puma, which is uh, Ruby. Their streaming API, which is one of the, one of two APIs that are accessible, is written in Node.js, so in JavaScript. Okay. Impressive, impressive choices. <laughs> yep. And then there is a whole bunch of uh, queues or queue-based processes. So you need to have Redis because of that. And those processes use something called Sidekick. This is a Ruby only technology that allows it. That it is basically a, a task runner based on queues. When you have an item pop into a specific queue, that queue tells it you, you need to run this process with the data that are in the message of the queue. Okay. And you have at least seven or six queues with one of them because you would want to scale certain queues beyond just one process. Especially if you're using a database or a Macedon, it has more than one person or if a very popular person, you would want to scale certain things. But there is yeah, one pro uh, if, one, if, one uh, queue. You have a... Go ahead. Uh, so uh, the main reason you would uh... You would want to have have something that can scale because you know somebody like me i have like i think i'm at like somewhere around 300 followers on mastodon uh i just have a lot of followers and yeah i don't know how many people i'm actually following but i know that's not exactly a small number either so uh you're going to have every single one of those people uh hitting hitting your server through the federation every time they go to look at your yeah. page and it's not actually that it's more, it's it's in both. It's both. It's what things go out, and what things come in. So, if you f have a lot of people that follow you, follow, or if your users will follow out of people, that means you need the incoming process. Incoming process needs to be replicated a lot because there'll be a lot of queues, queue messages for that. It'll be a huge queue. Yeah. Now, there is one queue that you cannot have more than one process running at a time called scheduler. If you do, you can mess up your instance completely. And there is no safeguards for it. You have to be the safeguards. Then, as, as I mentioned before, it isn't up to standard, the Docker containers. What happens is if you have a if, you, if you're upgrading, normally, normally in Docker world, and even in really in almost any program, well architectured program, <clears throat> when you run the first time, it would either detect that your database is old and either tell you, you need to run migrations or run the migrations for you. Especially with if you have a if you have the program in Docker container, it's what it's normal. Guess yeah. what happens? Guess what happens? Migrations aren't uh, run, and you can mess up your database. Yep. Yeah. So you need to read your change logs. I did that once. This is this is the fourth iteration of Mastodon for me. <laughs> <laughs> But outside of that, you also need to have a database. So Postgres is the only option. As I do need the Redis. It's for queues and for caching. And then good thing to have is some sort of a media cache, which uses uh, S3 based storage. Yeah. So object storage, S3, uh, R2, and, si and similar things that use S3 API. Just an internet storage bucket somewhere. Yes, object storage okay. bucket somewhere. That uses S3 API. That's a very important part. Yeah. 
Uh, now I have taken time to set up like uh, a Maria DB <coughs> with uh, Nextcloud before, and uh, have that set up to be like publicly accessible and all that stuff too, which uh, means that I had to set up like uh, make sure that authentication worked, which uh, so, thankfully yeah. it did, and that. And so, uh, is also an important skill to have. That's what I forgot because yeah. you need a reverse proxy because your when you have incoming requests. You need to point UI requests to one destination, streaming requests to second destination, and your standard API requests to third destination. Okay. And you need to have, but there are there are uh, already proper uh, what are those called? Proper co uh, sample configs already online. You can find. Okay. Well, uh, that could be it. That could be a project for some time later. Yeah. I do have a couple extra domains I'm not using. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, so depending on how well I can fix this situation, we might have either bigpod.mastodon.bigpod.se or we might be looking at new dash mastodon.bigpod.se as a domain for my Mastodon account. Uh. Just you guys wait. Uh, we might have mastodon.tuckspace.com. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, that could just be like tuckspace.com. Mm. <laughs> we probably should have like a front page. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who knows? But in the meantime, uh, Big Pod, if we ever do decide to set up our own Mastodon instance, I know that Mastodon by default has this wonderful blue theme. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's just like I, I want to burn my eyes a little bit, you know. And uh, I've been uh, messing around with light themes lately. Really? And, uh, you know, some of them actually aren't that bad. <laughs> just, just saying this now, lighted. I'm still, I'm still sticking to my old school retro arc theme, which I know has been the theme that you, that if you guys have watched any of my videos, that's the that's that blue theme that I almost always have. Uh, I barely ever go away from it. And uh, I'm using the Arc Light theme right now, and it's all right. Uh, and you know the uh, GTK4 theme of Adwaita looks pretty good in in a light theme. Uh, QT, no, just no. I can never get a QT application looking good, so uh, I just don't even care to theme them anymore. But well, uh, you know, I it, so. Uh, Big Pod, I know uh, you're a champion of the dark theme. Yes. Tell me why I should use a the dark theme. Because dark... You know, I'm not burning my eyes right now. <clears throat> uh, dark themes, in my experience, seem to be less, uh, how to say this, less sensitive to monitor brightness. Yes, you need to have your monitor brightness up, but variations in theme uh, whether it be between different sites or different applications, if they have different, slightly different themes, have a lot, completely different, have less of an effect on how bright your screen is and how, how the whole, ah, my eyes effect happens, which, yeah, sad to say, but light themes always had that effect on me, even between two applications especially in Windows, where that isn't, there isn't a unified theme enforced, which in my opinion is correct. Application should, should, be, should handle their own theming. But whenever I had to use light theme, I, it was always one application, for our application, maybe 25% was enough. For our application, 25% was way too little. For third application, 25% brightness on monitor was already too much. But there is a use for light theme. Is if you have a laptop and you're outside in the sun, then you probably want a light theme with monitor brightness all the way up. But otherwise, uh, I mean, it doesn't have dark to be themes. Up all the way up. Well, in most it's cases, yes. It's largely dependent on how good the screen on your laptop actually is. Yeah. Like, uh, yeah. my. So, uh, I'm currently daily driving a ThinkPad. Uh, this is a... 
I actually found this out last night. It's apparently an 8th generation uh, X1 Carbon. And, uh, you know, uh, the screen on it, it, it's using the matte screen, not the glossy one. And I know that at the, if I'm running a light theme, I can get away with like uh, 60 to 70% brightness on, on a sunny day. Now, obviously, if I am if I have the sun shining directly onto the screen, it does need to be brighter. Yeah. But for the most part, 60 to 70%, perfectly perfectly acceptable. Whereas, you know, the dark theme, no matter how bright I get it, I just can't see what the yeah. heck's going yeah. on. If I'm outside with my, my Dell, I, some, if I'm like in shadow, I can get with the light team. You can get get away with something like 50, 60 percent. Yeah, and uh, some dark teams I can use since I'm in shadow. I normally run with something like on while I, I'm I'm inside. I normally run with something like 25, 30 percent. Generally, all yeah, the time. I, but in direct sunlight, hundred percent light team. And I can, and I can see normally. Yeah. So, uh, with with the, the light theme, uh, just just it it it's not bad. I'll be honest with you. Like, uh, largely, yes. Uh, w if you're not used to using the light theme, and you go to turn on, you go to use a computer that has a light theme, uh, yeah, you're going to notice it right away with it. Because you know it's brighter, brighter than you're used to looking. But uh, I, there have been studies coming out lately, stay saying that like the whole eye strain uh, argument <laughs> is kind of not a valid argument. Wow! Well, but it obvious, obviously, it's largely dependent on the brightness of your screen. Yes, at, that's at the, end the, of the day. That's what it comes down to. That's the big part. But, yes. For the majority, but for the majority of things, uh, for the majority of the time, like uh, I, I'm using like these cheap Walmart displays because you know they're cheap and I can get them and yeah. I can get them when I need them. But uh, they're not going to get bright enough that like it me using a light theme is going to like absolutely ruin my eyes. Yeah, but let's. I'm gonna give you a quick question. Like, have you ever looked for minute or two into into a light like into a light sort of like your room light i mean yeah. you I feel mean, it I... yeah that's that's the especially since if you're if you're using dark team and you have like something like 50 75 percent brightness that's that's exactly what happens when you open especially white 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 team that's exactly like and the problem isn't the brightness itself. Once you get used to it, of course, there is no problem. You can adjust your monitor, even though, as I said, the problem is that white team is lot or light team is a lot more sensitive to to brightness of your monitor. But what happens if like if you're switching between dark and light team, let's say on pages? white team will hit you a lot harder for you to like that flash is a lot more problematic than let's say going from light team to a dark team that momentary flash can can have an effect on you but on a long term yeah that's not a thing especially if you can change monitor brightness and even that is you you have to change it a lot more especially if you're like uh, somewhere around you is a window. It's not fully light controlled room. Okay. That's at least that's my experience using light teams in past. <clears throat> and uh, you know there there pro you, there are other options. Like I know that. There, there is a Grovebox light theme, and you know, uh, Grovebox, uh, whether you like it or not, uh, it's awful yellow. So, uh, it does reduce that, like that blue, that blue light strain. That, yeah. Strain that. That's probably actually what you're, what you're dealing with when, when you, you enable the light theme and like you're, you feel, you feel it in your eyes. That's probably like that blue light right there. That, that's hitting yeah. you. So, uh, if you're wanting to experiment with the light themes, that's probably a place to start. Uh, 
fair warning though, Grovebox is very brown. Yeah. It, it's just everything has a shade of brown to it, and you'll either love it or you'll hate it. And then, of course, if you love the color uh, green, Solarized. Yeah. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, <clears throat> it, it looks ugly, yes, it does. But uh, Solarized is one is one of the very first like uh, Unix themes that came out based off of scientific study as to what makes you more efficient when you're working. So uh, maybe you get more stuff done. I don't know. <laughs> uh, fun fact: uh, If I, on my what's it called on my uh, VS Code, I actually have it set up for either monokai dimmed, so that's a gray monokai theme, gray blue, or if I if I'm outside and I need, and I know I'm gonna be in sunlight, so not under some sort of covering, like an umbrella. All those big umbrellas. I I have it set up so I can sw quickly switch to solarized light. Because there is no light monokai team that is de by default installed. Side face. I don't even know no. if light monokai exists, but okay. Uh, yeah, I'm using... Uh, I'm not using VS Code. Of course uh, I'm you're using, not. Uh, e no, but it should be. I'm not. Uh, because, you know, I like my Emacs. And uh, I'm using... Uh, let's see, what's the name of this theme here again? Let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Where is my themes? But while while, while we wait for those of ah. you on video, I'm gonna showcase you the effect of a light team, a very white light team, on a person. Like why why in my opinion such a problem? Those of you on <laughs> video, look at me, and you can you can even check this yourself. I'm using a website called BigPod.se, which ha which has both light and dark team, and check this out. This is a light theme of my website. It's very white. And this is dark. This, this is now me switching back to video feed of me and Josh. You, you saw the difference between a dark theme and a light theme and how, how much brighter I became for yeah. just switching between... A basically black and gray color scheme to white and white color scheme okay so yeah I, I found the themes it took me a minute because you know uh it's been a hot minute so like i actually looked at my emacs configuration file <laughs> uh i'm currently using the modus themes in emacs and uh they're unmodified <laughs> so uh they're just stock modus themes uh they look uh I mean, they're not the best looking themes. I'm just going to say that right now. But, you know, they're built in and they're functional themes, which is what I care about. And uh, they, it, they come with a light and a dark. Uh, by default, when I load, load up Emacs, it's going to load up in the dark theme. Because uh, a lot of times when I'm working on Emacs, I'm working in just this room. So, uh, it it's just what I use in this room. Because, well, this room, I don't have any windows. <laughs> but, uh... I can toggle to a white theme, uh, and you know I I use a script to uh, move it, so uh, I can just flip it like that. Yeah. Which. But it's really funny how you could saw like almost like a reflector being turned on when I switch to a light theme on my yeah. website. Uh, bear bear in mind uh, that brightness is also going to be flared from your camera too because your cam your yes. your camera picks up a uh, light in a different. Your your camera would pick up a uh, light differently than what you, like your eyes actually would. Yes, and but it but it does like it's an illustration of what what can happen, especially if you have wrongly yeah. set uh, 
monitor brightness, which I definitely have since it's very much set up for for dark team and mostly working in darkness or yeah. in lesser light situations because even though I may not have a window behind me, I have a window right over there, which means most of the time we'll have light streaming from there unless it's night, then we'll have light turn on and generally I have only one light on so it's at least a little bit darker than it is right now and generally I have them turned away but because I am recording I need to have more lighting on me mm -hmm. so I have them turned toward me alright well I think lighting situation basically what I'm saying is uh, around what team you're using uh, lighting is very important brightness of your monitors is very important and honestly the ri right team but in a lot of cases you cannot control that especially in the web which is why i prefer the dark team because they're generally less sensitive to changes but yeah i think we exhausted this topic way too much yeah so uh I want to get with another one here. Uh, I mentioned that uh, I reinstalled Gen 2. I, I figured that I'm also going to experiment with uh, getting away from Sway. Really? Uh, because uh, every time I install Gen 2, I, I'm i normally using the Sway compositor because, you know, I have been swayed. And uh, I am just... Uh, I'm Because, you know, I've got a configuration that I generally don't hate running. And it just kind of just works. And, you know, it's been a minute since, like, I went went exploring all the different window management systems. So, uh, I decided I'm going to uh, visit one that I did a video on, like, a year ago. Just to see where it's at nowadays. It's called LabWC. Uh, what LabWC is, it's a, it's it calls itself a stacking uh, Wayland compositor. Which basically means that it's a, it's a, it's not a uh, Tyler. And... And it functions more like your traditional desktop environment where, you know, all the windows float by default. Yeah. And uh, I have to say uh, that their development pace has been fairly rapid on it. And I think they've had, like, several releases since I last looked at it. And my configuration still works. I mean, yeah, obviously I miss, I'm miss i missing the uh, box theme file that I forgot to put in my dot files, so I have to go and find that again. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, uh, I'm glad to see that, uh, there, that there have been no breaking configuration changes. Good. Those are always annoying. Yep. And, uh... It is a very, very lightweight option, and uh, I believe that it's actually the Wayland compositor that the LXQT project is going to be picking up on. Interesting. Which, uh, if you, yeah, which uh, LXQT is basically just like a super lightweight desktop environment. Like uh, yeah. you hear about people talking about like installing Linux to revive old hardware and stuff. Uh, LXQT is a desktop environment designed for that purpose. Yeah. And so. And uh, it's it's the modern version of the old LXDE desktop environment, which uh, you know if you're if you're the neckbeard you've probably heard of before, or like if you've used a Raspberry Pi and used uh, the Pi OS uh, image, it that's what it's using is LXDE. Yeah. Which I don't even know why Debian is still packing packaging LXDE. It's a it's a it's been a dead project for like six years now. No idea. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's been working relatively well. Uh, it supports all the same Wayland protocols that Sway, that uh, Sway <coughs> supports, and uh, they've been keeping up with with them too. Uh, I think that uh, that uh, they even share some developers and everything, which has been uh pr pretty cool. And it hasn't crashed. Good. Which, you know, That's always that good. Just, that, that is always good because it means that it works more reliably for me than Hyperland does. Sorry, nice. Valtteri. Nice. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of all the WLR Roots compositors, uh, I have, like, hands down the best experience on Sway. 
Uh, I have messed around with River a little bit. Uh, I still need to, like, work on a couple things with my River configuration before, like, I even attempt to make this make the full switch to it. Because, uh, River works a lot like, uh, the tiling window managers that I'm used to running on, uh, X11, where I, I come from a DWM base. Uh, so, uh, I'm, I'm not using workspaces or, or virtual desktops, I'm using tags, uh, to manage the windows, which... They function a little differently, but uh, you can just use them just like desktop, uh, virtual workspaces or dynamic desktops if you want. And I do, uh, I I do recommend that like if you guys are curious on like the uh, stepping into a, into like a dedicated uh, win window manager role down from a desktop environment. Uh, this could be like a good first stop. <coughs> uh, bear in mind, LabWC, uh, n not all of their tooling might be in your distros packaging. Like, not even Gen 2 ships like some of the stuff, like uh, their menu gener generator or uh, or a couple other things. But uh, a lot of the old Opabox utilities does do work with LabWC because that's where LabWC gets its inspiration from is Openbox. So, like uh, your OB menu script. Uh, can work with it as well as uh, all of your open box themes so uh, you can go to box-look.org and just download any theme there and you can use it in LabWC which is pretty cool but uh, LabWC is also a GTK based window manager as well so uh, it can just work with your GTK themes nice which I thought was pretty neat Lighted, it's still GTK three, not GTK four. Yeah, but better than nothing. Yeah, that's true. It's better than you know making their own toolkit. <laughs> yeah. So, do you have anything else but, to say about this window manager or compositor? Let's use the right language. Yeah, uh, it is a compositor, not a window manager. Uh, it's a valent don't exist. nomenclature yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, we're we're completely in the uh, valent nomenclature. Uh, but uh, that's realistically about it. Like, uh, that's just <coughs> it. It just works. I mean, if you want to hear more about it, like uh, I have a uh, video about it. Because you know, I, at one point I had this wonderful series called. Uh, called the window manager project where the goal of that series is to one day have a video made about every single window management solution available to us on Linux <laughs> I have no idea how many there are but you're so nowhere near no that idea. yeah yeah but uh, we had but we are using both active and dead projects in, in this series <laughs> just, just to let you guys know <laughs> <laughs> so uh if you want to keep up with that series or you like you guys find like one one that could be worth uh, checking out uh go ahead, go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel you know and uh you know just uh just keep just keep an eye on it but uh of course uh you got to subscribe to the no tucks allowed YouTube channel for since you you know you're on YouTube cuz yeah. you know uh we do post our we do post our episodes to YouTube uh, they might show up a day or two later than the RSS feed, or a bit more than that. But yeah, or a bit they more. It's mostly up. it's it's mostly when we actually remember to actually hit hit yes. hit the upload button. Yes, or you know when Big Pod uh, realizes that he that he forgot to render the video file alongside the audio. <laughs> yeah, or that he but, for, forgot to upload it and he then does two episodes in one day. Yeah, uh, but you know you can just you can watch us on the YouTube. Uh, I prefer it if you watch us watch us through our self-hosted uh, podcasting solution, uh, which, by the way, uh, yes, we do in fact self-host uh, yes. the podcast. Uh, so uh, there are no privacy concerns between you, the listener, and me, the host. Yeah. There are, uh, suppose as long as you know you're using our feed directly. Uh, I can't guarantee. Like, if you're subscribing to us purely through iTunes. Uh, they might have a bouncer in between. 
But, you know, you can subscribe to us directly and get our podcast as raw as you possibly can. Yeah. <laughs> Which, hey, it it's not free to do that, right? Yeah. So it's not expensive right now, but it's definitely not free. So if you if you have an idea on how to help us help support the show, you c- there's an email address that you can contact. It's showing up right on the screen right now. It's probably above me today. <laughs> it, it's probably up there. Uh, that email address is going to be contact at tuckspace dot com. Every time you send an email to that, it's going to it's going to bounce it to both Big Pod and myself. Yeah. Uh, so either one of us can respond from it. Uh, can respond to it, but we do both see it. And, and of course, you, could... if you like the last week's idea of uh, doing a more high higher quality audio, which I'm actually pretty partial to myself, because it's fairly easy to implement. Please do tell us that you like like it as well, because I would I would be okay with making it. It just means a bit more. A compute time for my system and you know if we want to get really fancy with it I have been reading some FFmpeg documentation I'm certain I can come up with a recording solution to get the highest quality audio for that recording well OBS is supposed to be able to get 320 kilobits per second yeah, which but it... we can get we can get higher than yeah that. but the problem is that my the editing solution I'm using also supports at maximum of 320 with mp3 but we can use another format which can go higher yeah which of course would be a smart solution than to use something like aac or something like that but then that would be a lot more expensive for us since we would need to store out more uh, audio so we we need support from you guys for that to happen as the show grows the more we're going to be spending uh, because uh, it turns out that when you're sending and receiving data, data, that can actually cost more money than the actual storage itself. Yeah, I, I've been looking at prices, pr- price tiers here lately, and like, man, data transfer can be expensive. Data transfer Lighted. is expensive in cloud, yes. Yep, yep. Lighted, uh, we're we're serving over an S3 storage bucket, uh, hosted by a rather wonderful content, uh, content delivery service. Yeah. Uh, the that you know is just gracious enough to let us use a limited amount for free <laughs> yeah and they're still cheaper than my than the solution i was originally going to be going with <laughs> yeah that, that was a pretty but only l- lucky cheaper. find yeah but only slightly cheaper they're not really that much more expensive yeah but hey uh you know what it, it's fine but if you if you know one of us said something to personally offend you because you know, I, I did say some nasty things about about Ge- about my Gen two install. I'm sorry, Mr. Gen two developer, who's going to take offense to that. Uh, you, c- we do have our own Mastodon instances. You might not be able to shout at Big Pod right now, but you can definitely <laughs> shout at me. Remember, the currently it isn't working, and it may be subject to change. Hopefully it, not. It might be but subject might to be. change, but you, but. But you know, if you go if you go look at that profile, it's still all saved in the Federation. Yes. So it's all still there. So And it might be saved forever. He prob- <laughs> yeah, he, he probably posted something on there he probably re- regrets. So you you need to go there. You need to just completely export that entire profile and you need to read every single post and find something to hold him accountable to. <laughs> because I'm not willing to do that. But hey, I'm sure I'm certain that there's somebody out there that's completely willing to. <laughs> but anyways, guys, uh, that's it. Going to be that's going to be it for the show today. Uh, we will see you in the next episode. Goodbye. <laughs>